Chag Sukkot Sameach, happy Feast of Tabernacles. Thank you for joining us for the special Erev Sukkot service, the eve of the Feast of Tabernacles. We are so excited to be able to present this service to you in collaboration with Chosen People Ministries. Celebrate Messiah is part of Chosen People Global Ministries with network partners now in 19 countries around the world. And our special partnership is with Chosen People Ministries in the U.S. And uh, the president of Chosen People Ministries U.S. is Dr. Mitch Glazer, a personal friend and mentor of mine. And uh, we are really blessed that he'll be sharing a message with us tonight. And also really blessed that Paul Wilbur will be leading the worship. So thank you for joining with us. I trust the Lord will bless you. And remember, this is a time of rejoicing. So God will lift up your spirit as you lift up your voices to him on this special Erev Sukkot service. Shalom to you. Shalom, dear friends in Melbourne and across Australia. What a joy it is for me to be with you this final holiday of the fall festival season, Sukkot. I love the holiday as it encourages us to rejoice in the Lord. And we have so much to be thankful for, especially today, even though we're still at war with an invisible enemy. We're fighting the same battles, by the way, in the U.S., and we have to remember to pray for one another. We're part of one another for health and safety and victory. I was really thrilled to receive a picture the other day of Lawrence and Louise holding the keys to the Caulfield Messianic Center. Woo-hoo! What a journey. What a blessing for Beit HaMashiach and for the entire Celebrate Messiah family. May I add a special thanks to the board of Celebrate Messiah for their patience and guidance and the wonderful way they've supported Lawrence and Louise and Beit HaMashiach through this long process. Shalom board. And a special thanks to the leaders of Beit HaMashiach for your dedication to the completion of the center. I, I, I'm just in awe of what you guys have done. And mazel tov to all of you who are part of the congregation and around Australia who have worked hard, given sacrificially, and will soon move into this new absolutely gorgeous center and sanctuary that I can't wait to see. I know that you're going to be blessed, and I look for even greater growth for Beit HaMashiach as you now have facilities to expand. May the Lord bless you and keep you and use you in the lives of both Jewish people and non-Jewish people throughout Australia. We're so happy to be part of the Messiah's family and part of Chosen People Ministries, part of the network that God created where he has bonded us together in, in the love of Yeshua to serve him and to lift him up among our Jewish people. And I pray that the message that uh, I will now share with you from my sukkah booth will have an impact. God bless you. Shalom to you from Ramat Gan, Israel. My name is Moti and I work for Chosen People Ministries here in Ramat Gan. As you can see, I'm standing inside of the tabernacle, or as we call it, Sukkah. During the wilderness, the Israelites were instructed by Moses to build the Sukkah in order to dedicate the time to the Lord. The Sukkah is actually built outdoors, so for the feast, we actually go outside of our homes and dedicate our time to the Lord. Today, we still celebrate the feast to make sure that we have enough faith to live outside of our homes. As you can see, we decorate the sukkah in order to make it feel homey. Some of us will sleep inside the sukkah for seven days, while others will do anything else, but not only sleeping in it. So eating in it, spend time with our family, and on the other hand, also sleeping inside the sukkah. The sukkah is a great reminder for us for how God rescued the Israelites and even during the time of wilderness, he protected them and given them a small house. Today, we are safe in the faith of Yeshua the Messiah. And doing this, the sukkah reminded us as believers that Messiah is always protecting us during the difficulties of our times. Let's read from Psalm 122, verses 6 and 7. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. Let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
Our Father in heaven, Avinu Shabashamayim, thank you for your Son, thank you for the Messiah, thank you for what you have done to us and to the Israelites back then, while protecting us during the wilderness. And we know that today you are still protecting us during the difficulties that we have, that we're going through. Thank you for this feast who reminds us how strong you are and that you are the King of Kings. We are praying for the peace of Jerusalem every day and we are praying for more and more Israel, Israelis and Jewish people to come and know you, Father. And of course, we are waiting for the day that you will come in the clouds and Israel will say, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Chag Sukkot Sameach. Happy Feast of Tabernacles. And shalom to you from here in Melbourne in Australia, where we are streaming to you for the very first time from our brand new Caulfield Messianic Center. Yes, we only moved in a few days ago, and this is a 25-year dream and vision that has been realized, and we thank the Lord for His provision. We are so grateful to God for His blessing and His provision, and what a wonderful festival at this Feast of Tabernacles to be giving thanks to God for His blessings upon us. And right now, we're going to light the candles for this festival occasion. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kedishanu b'mitzvotav v'tivanu ne'adlik ne'i shel yom tov. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who enriches our lives with holiness and commanded us to kindle the Sabbath and festival light. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kedishanu al yadei Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom, O haolam. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through Yeshua the Messiah, Prince of Peace, Light of the World. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, she'echiyanu v'kiyimanu v'higiyanu lazman hazeh. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us alive and has sustained us and brought us to this festive season. And one of the special elements of the Sukkot celebration is rejoicing before the Lord with the four species that come from the land of Israel. And so from Leviticus chapter 23 verse 40, let me read to you from the Torah. On the first day you shall take the product of the citron tree, that's the etrog, branches of palm trees, which is the lulav, the nice tall branch, boughs of leafy trees, that is the myrtle, and then the willows of the brook, that's the Aravot. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Let's begin uh, our Lulav waving ceremony with our special blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Alam, Ashe Kedishanu BeYeshua Meshichenu, Hayei Bishmo Anachnu Nolim Et Hulav. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in Yeshua our Messiah, it is in his name we wave the lulav. And so I'm going to wave the lulav in six directions. And as I'm waving the lulav, my heart's prayer to God is that God will bless north, east, uh, south and west, and God will pour out his spirit. We're praying for revival amongst Jewish people, and we're praying that the Lord will break this COVID-19 curse uh, uh, over our world at this time. So pray with me as we pray in the six directions. Thank you. Yomru nabet aharon ki leolam chasdo. Let the house of Aaron now say, His love endures forever. Yoma na Israel ki leolam chasdo. Let Israel now say, His love endures forever. Yomru nahire Adonai ki leolam chasdo. Let all who revere the Lord now say, 
His love endures forever. Hodula Adonai ki tov ki le olam chasto. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Ana Adonai hoshiana. O Lord, save us now. We beseech you. Ana Adonai hatslicha na. O Lord, rescue us now. Hoshiana lama ancha Eloheinu hashana. Please save us for your sake, O God. Please save. Hoshana lama ancha Boreinu hashana. Please save us for your sake, our Creator. Please save. Hoshana lama ancha Go aleinu hashana. Please save us for your sake, our Redeemer. Please save. Hoshana lama ancha Doshenu hashana. Please save us for your sake, our Attender. Please save. Hine al Yeshuati eftach veloevchad ki uzi vezrimat Adonai vealili lishua. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Ushaftim maim besason mimanea Yeshua. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And on the last and greatest day of the feast, Yeshua stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. What wonderful words that Yeshua spoke on that Feast of Tabernacles 2,000 years ago. Hi, everyone. Paul will be here. What a joy to join you tonight on this era of Sukkot as we gather during an appointed time to worship the Lord. I'm going to start with a song tonight that comes out of 1 Kings chapter 18. This was not an appointed time. This is a time when Elijah gathered all of Israel together with him on the top of Mount Carmel. There was bad leadership. There was bad things going on. Ahab and Jezebel were the king and the worship leader of Israel. It couldn't have gotten much worse than that. But Elijah calls the people together and he says, look, it's time to make up your mind. If the Lord is God, then worship him. But if these idols, these Ashtoreths, these Baals are your gods, then worship them, but you have to make up your mind. I believe we are living in the days of making up our mind who it is that we'll worship. But I'm confident that in this place, in this evening, with this people, our response is Joshua 24, as for me and my house, we will worship, we will serve the Lord. Lord God of Abraham, O Isaac and Israel, O let it be known today that you are God. Yes, Lord, during this tabernacle, we offer up our lives as a living sacrifice. Come purify us with your holy fire. Holy fire, you are the holy one. Highly exalted one. And we've come to Worship at your holy hill. Yes, we have Lord. And you are the holy one, highly exalted one. And we surrender to your sovereign will. Oh Lord God of Abraham. and join me tonight. Lord God of Abraham. Lord God of Abraham. You 
power of Isaac and his So let it be known today that you are God. There is no other one like you. You come now and fill this place and be exalted in our praise. And let it be known today that you are God. You are God. You are the Holy One. Highly exalted One. And we've come to worship at your holy hill. Yes, we have. And you are the Holy One. Highly exalted One. And we surrender to your sovereign will. Oh, Lord God of Abraham. For the God, for the Lord, He is our God, and He shall reign forevermore. For the Lord, He is God, for the Lord, He is our God, and He shall reign No other name but the name of Adonai. Sings. 
Come on and declare it to the heavens. You are Lord over all the earth. You are Lord over all the earth. Good. Lift your voice. Come on. You are Lord over all the earth. So this is my sukkah booth. I grew up calling it a sukkah booth, but really sukkah in Hebrew is booth. And so we were always saying booth booth without really knowing it. And so welcome to my sukkah. I think I'm going to just stick to it, uh, the one word. This is a special prayer uh, as you walk into the uh, sukkah. And I'd like to say that prayer for you and with you. And maybe you'll uh, pray it with me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kuchanu B'mitzvotav Vutzivanu Leshev B'sukah. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to dwell in the sukkah. I wish I could take you on a tour of Brooklyn right now. It is party time. Everybody is thrilled because of the seriousness and soberness of uh, Yom Kippur and uh, previously Rosh Hashanah has turned to joy. And there are colorful ramshackle shack-like sukkah booths all over Brooklyn. On, in, in the Orthodox areas, they're almost on every fire escape. And if you're not from New York, you probably don't even know what a fire escape is. But if you had a fire, you'd want one, let me tell you. And so it is, uh, they're on a few front lawns, but we don't have a lot of front lawns, but there are sukkah booths everywhere and they are made of plywood and they're made of leftover wood they're made of tents this is what i got was a prefab booth and um, was really excited about it not easy to build by the way uh, but we decorate them beautifully and we sit in them and we're supposed to stay here for all seven days of sukkot and also to sleep and eat and uh, do uh, our what we usually do as a family in the booth the Feast of Tabernacles is all about joy, all about joy. And there's so much to celebrate, especially for followers of Yeshua the Messiah. Even in the midst of pandemic, season of economic hardship and social unrest, we are able to celebrate because Yeshua sealed the deal. On Yom Kippur, we hope and pray that when the 
gates closed than the Elah service that last night of Yom Kippur, that when the gates close, the gates to the temple and the gates to the city of Jerusalem close, that we will have eternal life. We will have forgiveness. But Jewish people for millennia have just never had that assurance. But those who have found Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah, both among the Jewish people and among the non-Jewish people, know for certain that the work of salvation was finished at the cross. And when he rose from the dead, he conquered death. And basically, our sins were left on Golgotha. And uh, we are free. Now, the Bible details quite a bit about the celebration of Sukkot. I'm reading from Leviticus chapter 23, verses 33 through 35. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the 15th of the seventh month is the Feast of Booths, Sukkot, for seven days for the Lord. First day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work of any kind. For seven days you shall present our offerings by fire to the Lord. And on the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord in all your assembly. You shall not do any laborious work. So Sukkot is very similar to other holidays. There is no work, there are gatherings, there are offerings, and it's a time where we are able to reflect upon an aspect of the character and work of God in our lives. Uh, there's more information in uh, verses 23, 39 through 44. On exactly the 15th day, that's exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, the month of Tishrei, when we celebrated all three of these major holidays, when you've gathered in the crops, you see it's an agricultural festival as well, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days with a rest on the first and a rest on the eighth. That's new information. So there is an eighth day added. In Hebrew, it's called Shemini Atzeret, and it's an eighth day to the seventh day festival that is added. On the first day, take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. That's the lulav and the esrog that I showed you uh, early, earlier. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute through all your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Now here's a specific command. You shall live in booths for seven days. So, welcome to my booth. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared to the sons of Israel the appointed times, in Hebrew, the Moadim, the Moadim, the appointed times of the Lord, God's holy appointments on the calendar that he gave at Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, and you cannot miss those dates. You, you've, you got them on your calendar, but you can't miss them. These are God's appointed uh, dates. And for most of the Old Testament story, the Jewish people did not actually observe God's holy calendar. And that was one of the bases for judgment upon the Jewish people. And that's why whenever you saw a revival within Israel in the Old Testament, one of the first things that was done was a celebration of a festival, whether it be uh, Passover uh, at one time or the Feast of Tabernacles even during uh, the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. So let's just go over a few of the essentials as we move along. The date, the seventh month, 15th day, seven days, an additional eighth day, and in modern Jewish tradition, a ninth day called Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah, where we finish the cyclical readings over the year of the five books of Moses, and we start again from Genesis uh, next week. And so we celebrate the completion of the reading of the Torah. Sok, Sukkot, of course, is also called the Feast of Ingathering. You saw that previously, but in Exodus 23, verses 6 through 7, you shall observe the Feast of of the harvest, of the first fruits of your labor. And so we understand that Sukkot is, a, is an important agricultural holiday. Actually, it's the first fruit, most people think, from the fruit harvest, because it is the final, uh, it's at the time of the final harvest, 
because after October, uh, that's the end of the harvest season, and then it begins the rainy season, which is very, very important in the celebration of Sukkot. We actually pray for rain because as God has brought in the harvest for the full year, we want to see it again next year. And so we pray, Lord, pour the rain out. And that had many spiritual implications as time uh, went by. Now, I view Sukkot and many of the other festivals as God's spiritual classroom. In fact, I believe that you can trace the creation of the old school, school kids game, show and tell, to Sukkot, because it was God's idea. We, we use the physical to teach us about the spiritual. And so by touching, by seeing, by hearing, as in the case of the shofar for Rosh Hashanah, as is, and by tasting as in the case of the, of the matzah, and as is Sukkot, because we're dwelling in booths. These are huge object lessons that are supposed to teach us about uh, God's uh, will and way for our lives. So the festivals are his spiritual classrooms whereby we engage all the senses so that we learn these lessons. That's why uh, the festivals are just so great for the kids. And, uh, and so they're important. Now, there are a number of great and very important lessons that we learn from Sukkot. The first lesson is this. God provides. God provides. The Lulav and the Ethrog teach us that God provides for his children. And because he provides, we can have joy. We're commanded to take the foliage of beautiful trees, as I did, palm branches, boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and rejoice before the Lord for seven days. It is a time to be happy. Why? Because God is our provider. So the, the ethrog, which is the lemon-like uh, piece of fruit, the palm branches, which literally is the heart of the lulav, the bough of leafy trees, which is myrtle, and the willows of the brook, of course, willow trees, and the palm and the myrtle and the willow are combined to, into what is called a lulav. And we use three willow branches and two myrtle and the one long pond fran to which the others are tied. And when we shake the lulav, front and back and east and west and north and south and all around, the joyful shaking of the lulav reminds us that God is in all things. He is everywhere and that he always provides. He causes the rain to fall. He causes the sun to shine. He causes the crops to germinate. We have the job of harvesting. Isn't that great? We can't do any of the other things. Only God can. The only thing we can do is harvest. It's a great spiritual principle because we understand that we can preach the gospel, we can sow seed, we can continue to preach and maybe bring some sunshine and some water uh, in, in terms of our increased preaching and teaching and the way we live our lives, but only God can make it happen. He is the one that makes the crops grow and he is the one that makes people grow spiritually. And our role is to be part of the harvest. Now, uh, it's very hard for us to appreciate firsthand an agricultural holiday because most of us, let's face it, we're not farmers. In fact, during the days of the pandemic, some of us aren't even going to grocery stores. So we're getting further and further removed from the creation of the food to the joyful eating of the food. But still, we are commanded to be happy because God is our provider. Uh, we are mustering up some authentic joy during these days is pretty difficult. And uh, you know that and, and I know that. And wherever you're, you're view, viewing this Sukkot celebration, uh, you know that we're in the midst of a pandemic. Our lives have been so disrupted and many of us have endured such significant losses of loved ones, of, of friends, of businesses, of, of finances. And we just, just really want to go back to normal uh, and the fellowship and the joy of everyday life. Let's face it, we miss our normal lives. Yet God commands us to rejoice. And you notice the Jewish holidays come whether you want them or not. Uh, we're on God's schedule. He's not on our schedule. So whatever man is doing, whatever is happening in our lives, the holidays always invade. The Shabbat invades us every week. 
and seven times a year the major festivals invade our lives. And so even if we're suffering, we're called to rejoice. In some ways, this has been the story of Jewish life in history. You know the old uh, saying about Jewish history, they tried to kill us, they failed, so we ate, so we celebrated. In the midst of all of the suffering that Jewish people have, have gone through, historically, crusades and pogroms and the Holocaust, the, all the battles around the, uh, 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 the establishment of modern Israel, no matter what happens, we are to endure suffering with joy. And that is at least practiced once a year at Sukkot. And uh, it's even more uh, important for believers in the Messiah. I love what Rabbi Paul said, Rabbi Saul, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To, to write the same things again is no trouble to me. And it's a safeguard for you. Philippians 3.1. Again, in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always, always. And again, I say rejoice. So what's the secret to joy? How do we find joy in difficult times? How do we find joy when we're suffering? And let's face it, we've been doing a lot of suffering lately. How can we rejoice when everything around us tells us that this is not an appropriate time to smile or to be happy? Are we speaking about some type of Jewish stoicism or ignoring the hardships we face? Not at all. I love the line in Fiddler on the Roof, and you love it too, and Tevye was told that the Jewish people would have to leave lovely Anatevka, and, and the Jewish people would have to move to Israel and to Brooklyn and uh, all these other places, which is really where they eventually moved, a lot of the Russian Jewish people. Tevye looked up to heaven, and he said, next time, choose somebody else. Why? Because Jewish people have been suffering throughout the life just because we are Jewish. But Sukkot still demands joy. Sukkot reminds us of God's care for the Israelite through the desert wanderings. And we're encouraged to ask the Lord today for the same provision and care that he gave to our ancestors. He provided the manna and the quails and even water out of a rock for our ancestors and his magnitude of provision and his power and his love for his creation has never changed. In Deuteronomy 8, 15 through 17, we read, He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water for you out of the rocks of flint. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers didn't know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. So the Lord allows us to go through these difficult times during our pilgrimage on the earth. Sometimes we walk through a garden and sometimes we walk through a harsh desert. And Moses concludes, otherwise you would have said in your heart, my power and strength of my hand made me this well. So God allows us to go through difficult times to shape our character so that we understand that he wants us to focus on him. He wants us to be dependent upon him. Why can we have joy? Because he is always with us and his nature and character never changes, whether we're walking in the garden or we're marching through the desert. Yeshua said much the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. He writes, he said in Matthew 6, for this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He continues in verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So you need faith to be happy because you have to believe that the Lord is the same today, yesterday, and forever. I am the Lord God. I never change. He never changes. He always provides for his people through thick and thin. Jesus continues, and Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Hardship and suffering 
dear brother and sister. Hardship and suffering purifies our soul. And we learn how to distinguish between our needs and our wants and to thank God who provides our daily bread. This is what we learn from fasting on Yom Kippur. It's what we learn from the Lulav and the Esrog. We learn that God always provides. Now, I think we need to take it one step further and apply this great lesson about God as provider. The Lord wants us as well to serve him by serving others. It's one of the messages of Sukkot, I believe. Sukkot calls upon us to be thankful and generous and happy, to be grateful to God for all he's done, to rejoice, but as is mentioned many times in the Torah, to also remember the poor and those who do not have what they actually need. You might look for one needy family this week and give from the abundance God has given to you. I believe God will bless and reward your generosity as you care for others the same way God cares for you. So one of the great messages of Sukkot is not only to be thankful, but to be so grateful that it spills over into generosity with others who do not have what you have. As Yeshua again said on the Sermon on the Mount, so when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, so the hypocrites do in the, as they do in the synagogue and on the streets, so that you may be honored. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left know what your right hand is doing, so your giving's done in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now there's a second major lesson as well, and that's gleaned from this beautiful sukkah, sukkah booth, my sukkah. Uh, God not only provides, but God protects. Moses commanded the Jewish people to live in booths for seven days. And the booths are not exactly built for long-term occupancy. They are also God's classroom. These flimsy structures with see-through roofs are supposed to remind us of the structures we lived in while traveling the Sinai for 40 years. Let me put it this way, if built correctly, without nails, with a see-through ceiling, and fragile foundation, you would not want to be in a sukkah in a strong wind or a hurricane. The sukkah reminds us of the frailty of human life. According to Jewish tradition, we're supposed to eat and sleep in the sukkah for seven days. The rabbi actually compared the sukkah booth to the human body, which is frail and eventually wears out. It reminds me, when I read this and read what the rabbis say, that we are all Chevrolets built with planned obsolescence. We're designed to wear out. I love the old hymn, which says, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. We need to view ourselves as perpetual tourists in this life and live with our future in mind. And the future goes well beyond this sukkah booth and this sukkah booth. The lesson is repeated in uh, much of Jewish tradition, which suggests that God is our sukkah, in fact, and that he is all we need. He protects us from life's dangers. He guards and he guides us through the twists and the turns and turbulences of life. He wants us to learn lessons from hardship, uh, or maybe he's simply calling us home. Sometimes things don't work out as we wish. Were there any believers who died during the pandemic? Well, you know there were. Are there any believers around the world who do not get enough of what they need and some even perish from hunger? It's true, it's true. So how do we put these together? We have a God who always provides and promised to provide, and yet we have individuals who pass from this life maybe a little too early. Well, I think we have to start with what the great rabbi from Tarsus, Paul said. In Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes, Romans 8, 28. I think I've worn that out in the last seven months. But we know that God has good in mind. Sometimes he allows us to suffer. Sometimes he wants us to 
alleviate the suffering of, of, of others. I think that's a, a duty as believers to look for suffering and to try and do something about it. But we also know that sometimes you can't do anything about it. And we know that sometimes people will pass from this life. And of course, with our loved ones, we would love to see them live forever, but nobody lives forever. We all pass from this life eventually. David wrote in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even if we have received a terrible diagnosis of our health, we understand that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he walks with us and he still has good purposes for us until the day he takes us to him, to himself. You see, God uses the desert to bring us to our knees. Deserts are not hospitable to human life. The days are too hot, the nights are too cold, and the water is scarce, and the oases are few and far between. And you know, we've lived in a certain type of desert for the last six months, and we've learned more than we wanted to ever know about life and death through the pandemic. It's driven many of us, believers and not yet believers, into the arms of a loving, caring, protecting Savior to seek prote protection. We have been humbled by the last seven months. The pandemic has revealed our weaknesses and limitations and has pointed to his power and strengths. There are solutions beyond this life that work far better than solutions in this life. We recognize that we cannot also easily defeat our enemies, especially when they're invisible. It's a great lesson for believers. It, these, these are hard to fight. It's hard to fight when you can't see your enemy. The Apostle Paul reminds us of the battle we're really fighting, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, he writes in Ephesians 6, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the evil one and having done everything, stand firm. We are fighting against powerful enemies that are even worse than an invisible virus. We're doing battle with the world forces of darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness. And this battle will be won, not with worldly weapons, but with the power of God by his spirit and the spiritual armor he provides for us to fight, to defend ourselves. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, and the shield of faith. And so the Lord is our protector, and we need to lean on him for protection. You know, every once in a while, you've got to read a children's story. And I love children's stories, especially um, children's stories about Jewish holidays. So. Relax, let me read you a little children's story. I'm gonna put my glasses on for it. Debbie and Danny were very unhappy, two nice Jewish kids. When they tried to fast all day on Yom Kippur, but they hadn't been able to go without food past two o'clock, even though their parents had told them that when they were older, they could have the self-discipline to fast all day, they wanted to do it now. When they tried to blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, they hadn't been able to make a real sound, just a little squeak. I'm older than them and I still can't blow one anyway. Now their parents were telling them that they were too young to sleep in the sukkah and they were not happy. Debbie and Danny had helped their parents build the sukkah. In fact, the reason their family had a sukkah of their own this year was because of Debbie and Danny. But when the kids said they wanted to bring their sleeping bags into the sukkah and sleep overnight, their parents said no. They said it wasn't safe. Debbie and Danny said the sukkah was safe, as safe as their house. A sukkah was God's shelter for the Jewish people for all the years when the Jews lived in the desert and they left Egypt. Their parents were impressed with Debbie and Danny's great desire and finally relented and allowed the kids to sleep overnight in the sukkah. And when, when the evening came, Debbie and Danny were eager to sleep and they decorated the sukkah with drawings and old New Year's cards, they had hung all sorts of fruit and decorations like me, and they got in their sleeping bags, ate a late night snack from the fruit hanging in the sukkah, and they went to sleep. 
In the middle of the night, they were suddenly awakened. The sukkah was shaking, but it wasn't from the wind. The ground itself was shaking. It was an earthquake. They heard a loud crash. A tree had fallen on their house, and they were scared. Then they remembered that they were in God's sukkah, so they didn't feel so frightened. They understood that the sukkah reminded us of God's power to protect his children. Their parents came out quickly, and they seemed to be more upset than the kids. You see, the tree had fallen on the roof above the bedroom where the children slept. And if they had been there and not in the sukkah booth, and if they had been sleeping in the house, then they might have even died. Thank God, the parents said, that the kids were sleeping in the sukkah. Charming little children's story with great application to adults. God protects, but his protection is not always obvious. Sometimes it's in his leading us to go from this place to that place. I was with a singing group many years ago in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and uh, we were there uh, not doing Jewish evangelism, but trying to reach people in the middle of that terrible crisis between uh, Protestants and Catholics. And we were scheduled to sing in front of this store. And uh, we had it all set, and we were going to plug in our equipment and everything else. And when we got there, the store owner said, I've changed my mind, you can't. And we were a little upset, I must admit. We argued, and he said, I'm sorry, I, you just can't do it. And so we went quite a few blocks away, asked another store, and they said, sure, you can do your concert here. We plugged in, we did the concert, and in the middle of the concert, we heard boom. Guess what? The store where we were supposed to sing was blown up by some militants. God spared our lives. Sometimes he protects us through our disappointments. You know what Swindoll, I think, said? God's disappointments are God's, uh, God's appointments. Maybe it was Martin Lloyd-Jones, whoever said it. Boy, were they right. <laughs> and we all understand that. God gives us the power to fight, but he also protects when we're asleep. God is the one who will protect you from the pandemic. God is the one who will protect you from whatever in life is opposing you. You just need to trust him and understand that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Sometimes his protection means that he brings us to his ultimate protection. You know, I'd like to read one more vo verse in closing because it really speaks of the hope that we have. And it's in the book of Revelation. I love this because it happens in the day when the whole earth becomes God's sukkah. Let me read from Revelation. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the sukkah, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And here it is, his ultimate act of protection, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, nor crying, or pain. The first things have passed away, and he on the, sits on the throne and says, Behold, I make all things new. Ultimately, our hope is not us going to be with the Lord. Did you know that? I know, absent from the body, present with, with the Lord, I understand that Many of you, like me, are waiting for that shofar to blow, and that's just liftoff, and we're brought into the presence of the Lord. I'm looking forward to it. I firmly believe that if I don't get to be with the Lord at that moment, that when I pass away, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. One way or another, I'm going to go be with Him. But you know, that's not actually the ultimate hope 
of the believer. The ultimate hope of the believer is exactly what he did in the incarnation. When God became man, he took on flesh and tabernacled among us. The ultimate hope for the believer is not that we go to him, but brothers and sisters, he comes to us. And knowing Jesus is a reminder of this incredible truth, a truth to live by, that God came to us. He will come to us. He tabernacled among us, and his ultimate tabernacle will come onto this new and refreshed and refined and renewed earth. That day is coming, and even if temporarily we're with him, one day he will tabernacle on earth, and the entire earth will be his sukkah. I look forward to that great day. He provides so we can rejoice. He protects so we can feel safe, and he gives us hope because one day he's coming. Chag Sameach, happy Sukkot, and I pray that you will be able to rejoice in the Lord at all times. One of the names of this wonderful festival is Zaman Simchatenu, the season of our rejoicing. And it is in fact the Lord who commands us to rejoice at this Feast of Tabernacles. And the rejoicing comes from the fact that at Rosh Hashanah we have repented from our sins, at Yom Kippur we have been forgiven for our sins, and now we can truly rejoice before the Lord our God. Let me read to you from the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 14 to 15. Rejoice at your festival, you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female slaves, the Levi'im and the foreigners, orphans and widows living among us. Seven days you are to keep the festival for the Lord your God in the place Adonai your God will choose, because Adonai your God will bless you in all your crops and in all your work, so you are to be full of joy. What a wonderful command from the Lord to rejoice and that he will pour his blessings upon us. And so this festival is, an act, is in fact one of the harvest festivals in the cycle of festivals of the year. And we are thanking God for his blessings, his later harvest. And uh, the scripture tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 16 to 17, three times a year, all your men are to appear in the presence of Adonai your God in the place that he will choose. At the festival of Matzah, of Passover, at the feast of Shavuot, which is uh, uh, the feast of Pentecost, and the festival of Sukkot, tabernacles. They are, they are not to show up before the Lord empty-handed, but every man is to give what he can in accordance with the blessing that Adonai your God has given you. And so this is a time for us to bring our offerings to God, our thanksgiving offerings of what he has blessed us with. It's a free will offering time where we thank God for the harvest and we pray for a harvest that is still to come. And we believe that there is a latter-day harvest that is to come, a revival amongst Jewish people that will result in a revival amongst the whole world, life from the dead for the whole world. And that's what we are praying for and working towards through the ministry of Celebrate Messiah and in our congregation here in Melbourne, Beit HaMashiach. We are looking for a worldwide revival, a pouring out of God's Spirit in these days. So please pray with us, and would you also support us in this ministry that God has given us. Remember what Yeshua said about the harvest. He said to them, to be sure, there is a large harvest, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest that he would speed workers out to gather in his harvest. And so we are expecting a great harvest. We're expecting God's pouring out of his spirit upon Jewish people and upon the rest of this world. A revival amongst Jewish people, but we need workers. Let this offering that we take up tonight be an offering that we will give to speed up the workers, that the Lord will bring new workers into the harvest, that we'll be able to complete the work that God has given us to do. And we ask you to pray with us that God will provide with us uh, and for us a new generation of leaders for the Messianic movement to bring the gospel to Jewish people, which is in fact one of the primary purposes of this new Caulfield Messianic Center. 
We are hoping that from this center, we can train the next generation of leaders uh, for the Messianic movement to take the gospel out uh, to Israel and to the nations. So pray with us and work with us, believe with us, and help support us in this venture. Let me just pray for our offering this evening. Our Vinu Malkainu, our Father and our King, we plead with you, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers. We pray, Lord, that we would have all the resources that we need to see your name glorified, your name lifted up here in, in Caulfield, but also in Australia and around the world. And we pray, Lord, and thank you with all our hearts for the provision of this wonderful center. And now we thank you for this new era of ministry that you have called us to, a time of outreach, a time of proclamation, a time of training, a time of growing. And Lord, we are so excited and we are so thankful to you deeply from the bottom of our hearts. Lord, we give you thanks. Thank you for this harvest time. May you bless this harvest, we pray. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. And may the Lord bless each one of you as you sow into the harvest. Thank you. Come on, give him some praise right there. His name is El Elyon. His name is Adonai. His name is Elohim. He is Yeshua HaMashiach. His name is above every other name that can be named. And so David said, from the rising of the sun to the place where it goes down, the name of the Lord is forever to be praised. So let's praise Adonai. like him, lion and the lamb, seated on his throne, mountains bow down, every ocean roars, to the Lord of hosts, come praise him, praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun, to the end of the
so, Lord, tonight, with all the angels and with all the saints on this Arab Sukkot, we sing your praise because you alone, you alone are worthy of it all. What a wonderful service it has been tonight. Uh, what, not only a Feast of Tabernacles, but our Shabbat service as well. What a wonderful way to enter into the seven days of worship for the Feast of Tabernacles, a time of great rejoicing. May the Lord bless you. May you rejoice. May God give you great reason to rejoice over these next seven days. And let's remember all of His great blessings to us. A special thank you to Dr. Mitch Glazer and also to Paul Wilbur, for your blessings and leading us in a very beautiful, worshipful service tonight. Shalom to you all, and God bless you all. Shavua Tov. Have a great week. Thank you for your ongoing support of Beihat Mashiach Messianic Congregation so that we can continue to fulfill our mission of building a Messianic community of Jews and Gentiles who are a living testimony for Messiah Yeshua. Donations can be made through our website, beihatmashiach.com, by credit card or PayPal.